Hello, my name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College, and welcome to the Folks Film Series. Tonight's film, a documentary distributed by Focus Features, its title, Final Account, Final Account, very alluring title, uh, and it's a very alluring concept. Uh, this is a film that tracks the last generation of Nazi perpetrators, uh, collaborators, bystanders, even those who served in the Hitler Youth. Uh, it, was, it, it was a 10 year project in the making. Uh, hundreds of people, these are all people who were supporters of Adolf Hitler in some way or another, in some fashion or another. Uh, they ended up serving in the Waffen SS, in the Wehrmacht, they were concentration camp guards. Again, some of them were Hitler Youth. And then of course, when the war was over, they sort of moved, they blended in with the general German population and served as farmers and pharmacists and, and school teachers. Uh, and we're, we're hearing from them, it really was almost a race against time. We're hearing them uh, at, their, at, at the, the very end of their lives. Uh, in the film feature, is featuring each of them as they're very in old age. And I'm assuming that many of them since the film has been released probably have died since. Um, so you're seeing them like sort of there, it's we're, in a strange way, the film uh, provides an opportunity for those who supported Adolf Hitler to have their last rights. I don't think the film thinks of itself as if it was priestly in that way, but the opportunity was there for them to speak openly uh, at, for the last time about their association with uh, the Third Reich. Uh, we are not coming to you live today. Our two filmmakers are from the United Kingdom, so it's taped. We don't, we, I don't think we've done this before, but you will be able to watch this on live Facebook. So if you're seeing us live on Facebook, welcome. Always remember, go to folks.org and uh, get, provide us with your uh, email address uh, so we can, uh, uh, we can reach out to you for future upcoming events. Uh, we are joined tonight by one of the producers, John uh, Batsik, uh, and one of the associate producers, Sam Pope. Uh, unfortunately, the director of the film, Luke Holland, uh, passed away uh, in 2020. So he spent 10 years with the film. Sam Pope, I think, served with him for a number of those years. Uh, but he, he did not live to see its, its theatrical commercial release. Uh, but let's hope that we can uh, do him justice uh, tonight. I know that he would be happy to be represented by John and Sam. Uh, and uh, it, is a, it's a, it is a remarkable film. Let me say the last thing about it is that the film, my understanding, and maybe uh, John and Sam uh, can confirm this, that you, uh, at the Shoah Foundation at the University of Southern California will be using this film as part of its teaching tools. All right, welcome, uh, John, uh, Sam. Um, uh, let's start with the title, Final Account. Mm. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, title because it could sound like we're closing the books on the Holocaust, an account, a final account. I love the word account um, because it suggests the word accountability and you're speaking to people who should have to some degree some accountability. Also, we know Germans are very good with numbers, ledgers, schedules. Uh, you know, Germans make for very good, you know, CPAs and accountants. Um, there was such precision in the Nazi killing machine. So there is something there as well about an, an accounting, a, a reckoning. Uh, so maybe the two of you can speak to that a little. Absolutely. Um, so, the, I mean, the title Final Account has its origins going well before uh, Final Account, the actual of this project. Um, it was the working title for Luke's previous film, I Was a Slave Labourer. It was something that occurred and of course got lost in, lost in the, um, on the way, but it's something that had stuck with him. I think in some ways Final Account serves as, sort of, it's, it's almost ironic. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily the final account of, of history, but it certainly is these interviewees' final accounts. I love Nothing. that you said ironic, because I actually wanted to say earlier, is it ironic? Because it sounds like, yes, go ahead. No, certainly, yes, absolutely. Um, it, was, it was a difficult one. We did, we did debate about it um, a, great, a great deal. And I think and I've, I've seen it um, a sort of perhaps uh, mistakenly referred to as the final account in some, in some articles, which of course, absolutely not. The the is, very, the, the is a small, difference, but it's an important one. This is definitely not the final account. It is a, a final account and whose it belongs to. Certainly it's theirs. 
um, but it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say couldn't necessarily consider it a final account for history, and definitely not for this story. John, do you have anything to add to the title? Because we had lots to talk about. I'm just curious if you have anything. If not, we'll move on. Not really, no. I think Sam's pretty much summed it up. Okay. Um, I can't help but notice it was just within the last few days. You guys live in the United Kingdom. Uh, on Monday, all throughout Europe, in the major capitals of the, the most of the countries, uh, there was, in connection with protests involving the war in Gaza, there was chanting in the streets. You may have read about this. It was not widely, it was not widely uh, covered by the mainstream press. Uh, I have an essay coming out today or tomorrow that'll mention it. But there was uh, marches throughout major capitals in Europe, uh, marchers uh, draped in Palestinian flags and shouting death to Jews, death to Jews. In the middle of the street, major boulevards, Marble Arch in London, right? Everywhere that you'd want to be, Madrid, Paris, Brussels, all those major capitals. Now, here we have a film that traces uh, the last days of the evil that led to the death of Jews that we think about when we think of the Holocaust. And so let me just add, frame the question this way. Um, the, the film focuses entirely on the perpetrators themselves, uh, although they don't refer to themselves always as perpetrators, and we can talk about that as well. Uh, what was the reason to focus on the, those who were supporters of Hitler in some way, as opposed to even integrating the voices of survivors, Holocaust survivors? Why just the voices of perpetrators? Well, I think we only hear from the voices of the perpetrators. This is a, a decision that we made very early on, and it was one that was almost, almost required, it required very little debate. I think by by aligning, by laying um, alongside one another perpetrator testimony and survivor testimony, it creates some form of equivalence, ah. as though we're saying that this history is in any way, that these accounts in any way comparable. Um, I think, uh, I don't know who's, who was it who said, I believe it was not Michael Vilt, but the line um, that informed very much this decision was uh, in all conversations about survivor testimony and perpetrator testimony, uh, we must avoid the language of equivalence. Yeah. These two are very different accounts. The survivor accounts we must listen to, believe, understand, and the perpetrator accounts, they have many motivations perhaps to mislead. Hmm. Um, we certainly don't have any, uh, the intention of this film is in no way to uh, question history or question, um, question the, uh, the facts, the facts of the Holocaust. You know, the, um, the film it has this one scene, but it's just one scene in which a daughter of one of the perpetrators uh, is in a car, maybe with you, Sam, or Luke, uh, and she's off to see her father. Uh, we don't know at the time that her father uh, was a Nazi in, in some capacity. Um, and then she says, she says at some point, well, in my house where we grew up, it's not even talk about what you did at the war. We were not allowed to ask any questions about anything. Mm -hmm. The children were told, don't speak unless you're spoken to. Uh, that's the only child of the perpetrators that's mentioned. I know that you filmed hundreds of other people, and I'll ask at some point, how did you whittle them down to the get an hour and a half of film? Uh, but did you have other children of perpetrators? Because, you know, it is interesting where she's sort of asking him questions on your camera, and it seems like she's asking for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think the viewer could reasonably say, Oh, give me a break. Really? The kids never, none of these kids ever confronted the parents. They were that afraid of their Germanic strict parents that none of them at any point said, hey, mom, hey, dad, what did you do during the war? Well, this is, yes, absolutely. And this is something that uh, Luke thought about a lot, too. There was the question in the post-war period, you know, it, it was there was a, it was characterized as the great silence. These perpetrators, the people who had been involved, didn't want to speak about their crimes. Um, or what they'd done during the war. Um, Luke also thought that um, it may have been a, a great not wanting to hear, that not necessarily that these people didn't, didn't feel they could ask the question, they didn't want to know, they didn't want to ask the question, because who, be, um, who wants to be the child or the grandchild of, uh, of, a, of a criminal, of a perpetrator? Um, though slowly, again, later on, many, many decades later, these questions did start to ask, people did start to wonder, perhaps a, 
it may be, have been an effect of being a generation removed, perhaps. The grandchildren seemed a little more willing to, uh, to question their grandparents. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. There were a couple of accounts, uh, different occasions where children, um, children and grandchildren were involved. Um, or it within, not necessarily within the interview, but were present for the interview. But a lot of them pulled the plug on some occasions. They said, uh, you know, they, they, they would, when it was just the, as the interview was getting into perhaps dangerous territory for their grandparents, they would come in and say, oh, I'm very, very sorry, my, uh, my father or my husband or my wife is feeling a little bit tired now. I think it's probably time for this interview to end. Well, John, let me ask you, um, I, I thought about this in the context of sort of classes I've taught or things I've written. I don't know how much of this you know about the, you know, the Demyanyuk case, these, the cases were, that were brought uh, in the United States against Nazis that somehow uh, managed to come to the United States as a refugee of war uh, and, of course, did not disclose on their visa application what they did. They lied and then eventually they were uh, denaturalized and deported. And so there have been a number of those cases. The most famous was the Demyanyuk case where he eventually does go back to Germany. At one point, he goes to Israel. And one of the comments that came out of these trials, and I think it's really apparent in your film is, you know, mass murderers, when they hit their 80s, look cute. They don't look like mass murderers. They look very fragile, very vulnerable, wretched. There's a couple scenes in this film, I forgot the name, one of the characters, he keeps, you see him walking into his room and he's like L-shaped, you know? He, you know, again, decrepit is the best use of the word. You're watching a lot of decrepit Germans uh, speaking about what they remember, including their youth, the Hitler youth. It's a fascinating concept, but it does, I don't, I don't want to say humanize, but do you, think that there's some argument to say it's nothing you could have done about it, but just something natural about when you look at someone at that age, they just don't look lethal or dangerous. John? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting observation, I suppose. You know, you're right. And in some respects, that's, you know, their ordinariness is part of what makes this whole story so shocking. It's they aren't, they don't have horns coming out of their heads, you know, they're not, they don't have fangs, they're ordinary people who chose to behave extraordinarily. And in that respect, you know, I think that's much of the power of those testimonies and of those, uh, and of the presentation of, and in a way, it's one of the things I appreciate about the way Luke presents everyone in this film, it's not dressed up, it's actually, in some respects, rather lo-fi, but that's actually because because what's important is, is just purely their delivery and what it is they have to say. And the fact is, as I said, there's, they aren't extraordinary looking. They are like my grandfather or, you know, they, 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 they look like old people and they yeah. are, they're ordinary old people, but they're ordinary old people who played an extraordinary role in, in, you know, in a terrible passage of history. But it makes the unimaginable even more unimaginable, right? I mean, that word is often used to describe the Nazi atrocities, unimaginable, uh, unspeakable. But when you see this particular cast of of players who are really telling the story of evil, it's, there is, I think, a disconnect, you know, a kind of uh, cognizant dissonance to saying, that guy, that guy, that guy doesn't look like he could do anything. No, uh, no matter what he, uh, he, no matter what he admits to, it is interesting about the effect that has on the viewer to imagine monstrousness and then seeing such vulnerability. Sam, anything on that? Yeah, no, it was, I mean, that, that very point was what, when I first saw this material um, back in 2011, it's what, what disturbed me the most. It is their softness, it is their remove. The, as John said, they look like your grandparents. I remember there's a particular chap who even has a physical resemblance in the film. He looks like my grandfather. Is that right? Um, and it is, <laughs> and it is, and that is, I think, where, and partly you do, and you find yourself Sort of looking at these people in that way you know as they're because they're suddenly humanized humanized in front of your yes. eye um and that is the possibly one of the most disturbing aspects of the yes. film, watching these accounts yes um it is suddenly you're confronted with this this knowledge and i think it's rather important it removes this it breaks down the barrier of the notion i think when we uh, certainly when i pictured when i pictured perpetrators and i pictured the nazis i pictured the uniform i pictured the symbolism the ideology but not necessarily the human face underneath 
and it is it's a it's a face recognizable to all of us yeah and interesting you know the film opens with a wonderful primo levi quote you know primo levi is perhaps the best known of the holocaust memoirist memoirists in europe the book is called if this is a man in the united states the book is called survival in auschwitz i would commend it to any of our audience if they haven't yet uh, read it but there's a quote that you said you know something about monsters and that monsters you don't normally see or they're hard to believe in or they they don't appear but i'll tell you what you do see you see a lot of functionaries he uses the word functionaries you know again the ordinariness that john spoke of before that word has now been used by both of you several times and now i said it too <laughs> and primo levi just said it and it's a disturbing word i'll tell you why because we use the word, and I looked at your press materials, ordinariness, you know, we're talking about people who, yes, eventually became farmers and clerks and postal delivery persons and grocers and teachers. But for a period of time, they were in the monster business. Mm. They were in the atrocity business. But, you know, as ordinary as we discuss their jobs after, in the movie, the ones who were in the SS use the word elite all the time. All the time. They love that word. You know, I don't know what the German word for elite, but the translation of elite comes up in the translation a lot. And it's because they were very proud of being the best of the best Nazis who could make it into the, you know, the elite. In fact, you see amazing footage of the Nazi youth, Hitler youth, and you see how athletic they are, right? And you can see how, how proud they were that the next step after the Hitler youth was maybe the SS, if they're lucky, if they're, if they're athletic enough, if they're smart enough, if they're tall enough, they'll get to be the SS. That's what's so interesting about this film. It's not the first time elderly people said, I had nothing to do with that. But I'll tell you, it's the first time I've ever seen where you have this very, in my view, very moral, horrendously immoral conflict in the movie of people telling you, I was the elite, and yet I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> As opposed to, you know, I was just standing around minding my own business. <laughs> Someone told me to hold a gun. These, no, this, you had, this was an audition process that you, to get to that level, I think, what was it? 900,000 members of the SS the best of the best in Germany, the best of the best. These guys are showing us their, their SS tattoo, and they're also saying we had really nothing to do with any atrocity. What do you, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's, I mean, partly there's, there's a differing of, the difference of opinion. I think part of, the, uh, part of the challenge that Luke faced was to question this myth about the, the SS often denied, their, denied the claim that they were ever involved with the crime. Of course, an absolute, nonsense the ss stop and cop and band were directly involved they, they were the camp guards and in terms of uh, their their relationship to camps clearly there was it was quite demonstrated i think in it fact, is in fact they supervised the building of them absolutely yes and in some in some cases involved in the building the actual yeah. laying of bricks and mortar right. um i think it is let me try and remember whether there's no, I think that there's a moment in the film, there's a, a gentleman, uh, Herman Knott, he talks about, um, it's not just an elite in a physical sense, but also a spiritual and moral elite. Ah, yes, I love that. Good memory, Sam. Thank you Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. I mean, it's, and it's, and it's, it's incredible. I mean, again, they considered themselves not just uh, physically, but they, they were the best of German society. That's what they were considered. They were deployed. Um, these marks, I mean, and again, I find that that discussion as well is, is absolutely fascinating, but they were, the, the, the reasons why they were given the, uh, the tattoo under the arm, Differed, you know, there were there are multiple different narratives. Partly, yes, to well, one of them. One of them has a very good answer. You know which one I'm talking about, mm. right? We Absolutely. Give, tell the audience the one I'm thinking of. Uh, you're talking about that. This tattoo meant you could never deny you were involved in the SS. <laughs> yes, you're yes. marked out forever. Yeah, you're 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 in. You're all in. You're all in. There is no way for you to claim you weren't among us. Uh, by the way, is there any uh, any authority for that? Is that it was I mean was that guy being incredibly original in his thinking or was that actually part of what the SS was thinking? You're you're in on this and no you can never claim you're not part of the conspiracy. You're part of the conspiracy. There's a tattoo that shows that you were among us. Well, it's a, and again and it, it's purely a theory I think, and it's there are multiple questions about why this tattoo and again raised in the film 
it was only ever given to SS men, never the Wehrmacht, never anything. If it served a practical purpose, clearly, surely it would be, you know, it would have marked everyone out, you know, how useful to save someone's life on the battlefield, as they, you know, as they point out. But only the SS. So it clearly, it's either it's either marking out, marking themselves for as an elite, as, as sort of as separate from every as a separate entity, as more important, the blood is more valuable. Or, you know, but maybe it has this reverse effect that you will never be able to run away, that you will always be marked to this crime. Um, John, do you think that, you know, it's so interesting. On the one hand, as I said in my introduction, which you guys might have not approved of, I said, it's almost like giving Nazis their last rights. Mm -hmm. One opportunity at the end, they're not gonna, no one's gonna ever put a camera in their face like this ever again, what Luke did. And so they have one shot, one more time to say what happened if they haven't yet spoken. So I have two questions for you, John. Number one, do we know whether these people, in order to have been selected by Luke, that they had to have said, I never talked about it before, that in fact, I am pure. I never spoke about it to anyone. That's my first question. And, and, and then the second question is, because we catch them so late in life, can we trust them? Their memories, they're so old, you know, and, and, you know, do we trust their memory or do we trust their desire to look better, right? The last time you'll see me talking, you know, the world will watch this movie. Kids, kids through the, you know, Shoah Foundation are going to watch this movie and I would like to be presented <laughs> in a better way. And so I'm just not going to really speak honestly. And I'm so old. Can you really trust what I'm about to say? It's a tough question to I mean, I'll take your second question first. It, it, it's hard to be able to really accurately answer that. I think, uh, you know, my my, you know, my sense of these characters is that that you can trust them and that 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 they you are can, can can you can yes. No. I think I don't think they see it. I genuinely feel like they well, for the most part, certainly those those that stand by their actions are proud of their actions and 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 are i think confidently recounting the best times of their lives and they don't have any shame about it they actually they stand by it and therefore i don't think they're exact i don't think they're exaggerating um in terms of whether or not <clears throat> sam is better to answer the first question because sam has been on the project for 10 years and so we'll know what luke's and uh, originally whether luke picked out people who had never talked spoken at all but certainly, I know that a lot of them, this was the first time that they had spoken. But I, I, I suspect Luke, Luke also spoke to people who had, who had broken ranks before. And had spoken. It reminds me of something else that maybe one of you can answer. Uh, Sam, you can answer that other question that John just left you with. But I want to add to that. You know, um, there were some interesting things that were said about the Nuremberg trials. And I'll try to get to that soon. But I want to talk about something else for a moment, which is that the movie doesn't talk about the Frankfurt trials. People, everyone seems to know about the Nuremberg trials, right? But they don't really know that there was also, I think they were called the Krakow trials. There were trials in Poland around 1950, uh, basically done by communists against those who uh, you know, committed atrocities. Then the Frankfurt trials were in Frankfurt, Germany in the early 1960s, in which the Germans themselves, remember in Nuremberg, the allied powers, uh, created a tribunal in Nuremberg and prosecuted the Germans with a whole new set of laws that didn't really exist. By the way, a whole crime that didn't even exist really at the time that the crime was committed. Um, but Frankfurt was different. Frankfurt was German on German, German prosecutors, German judges, German ju juries prosecuting oftentimes these guys not famous Nazis. The famous Nazis were prosecuted at Nuremberg and they were already dead or had been hung or killed by then. In 1960, it was people who were a, a school teacher, a math teacher in third grade, you know, that they located people and they prosecuted. Do we know whether anyone in this film was prosecuted during the Frankfurt trials? Well, uh, to answer, just to go back to the, the first point in terms of, of who Luke met or how, you know, had they spoken before, some of them had, some of them had appeared. I mean, it's one of the reasons we found, I think, one or two of the interviewees had, had done uh, appearances who had spoken on, gone on the record before. 
uh, but the majority of them, the vast majority, had never had this uh, interaction. A lot of them found it, um, it was, yes, their first, and sometimes it was their first time revisiting, at least in their, um, their own accounting, of actually thinking and reflecting about this past. Um, and it is remarkable, and just to speak to, to, to John's point about the memory, um, they, so many of them keep photo books of their time, of their experiences of themselves, if they were served in the SS or in Wehrmacht in uniform, but also all their little um, Ausweis, their little Hitler youth books. They kept their yeah. records and they've, they've held on to them, all these little, little badges and pins and uh, patches. It is- and, uh, and, and, and songs. Yeah. They were, yes. it's so interesting. The movie is very interesting about songs. Songs are and interesting. Uniform. Music is interesting, right? That they would remember songs. Go ahead, John. Well, I said, and uniforms, you know, be, remembering the nice little necktie they wore and, yeah. and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, that they could still sing the songs and like the songs, you know, they weren't embarrassed by the songs. Yeah. And there was wasn't there one, one song that ended with something like, and stick a knife in the belly of a Jew? Mm. Did, I, think I, it's, did uh, I just make that up? Wasn't no, 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 that, I think that's yeah. just blut, blut muss fließen. The, yeah, um, there was something, and he was literally saying, well, I guess it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> said, absolutely. You know, as if he, he realizes, stick a knife in the belly of a Jew. Go, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. But I think, yeah, and again, it also speaks to this, this notion of where, this, this question that the film poses about where does perpetration begin? And it's, it's in these small innocuous seductions. I mean, you hear this song, I mean, and it's, it also puts a, a sort of, it challenges the notion of the life. We didn't know what was, you know, we didn't know, we had no idea that this would happen. Uh, how yeah. could you deny that if you're marching if you join the hitler youth maybe you're excited and you're having fun but how do you how do you ignore the anti-semitism how do you yeah. ignore the violence that's in the uh, right right you're saying you're language. saying once john sings once you get the tie right and the songs right at yeah. some point you got the universe at one point you have to think about the moral consequences of what you're being asked to do and yeah. you're saying they don't really address that is that right we, uh yes sorry go on john no no no, no I I mean, they address it by not addressing it. They make as if they don't make the connection, you know, but obviously, as Sam says, it's not possible that you couldn't make the connection. It's just a sort of collective fog descends in order to prevent them from acknowledging the reality of what it is they took part in. Those, those of our characters who choose to continue to say, oh, but I didn't know what was going on. You know, that's, that's how they do it. Oh. So and there's this, go ahead, John, Sam. Sorry, sorry, yes, I don't mean to keep interrupting, but no, I think no, no, and also no, no. it speaks to uh, the memory as well. I mean, this question about how, how accurate are the memories, the, they are not reading from songbooks. These are, they remember the lyrics, they remember the tune, they just, they, they were mercifully formed. And it's, again, remarkable how many of them remember these songs. And how, given how old they are. And we have to assume, because we know in Germany, not in the United States, but in Germany, collecting memorabilia, Nazi artifacts, not Nazis in the United States are protected under the First Amendment. They're not protected in Germany. If the neo-Nazis want to march in Germany, they're marched straight to jail. So mm -hmm. the reason this is important is it's not like they were singing the songs every day, because that would be really a bad idea to be singing those songs every day because someone could hear it and you could end up being prosecuted. So that's what I find even more remarkable. It's like they weren't in rehearsal. They just knew it. But also, yes, yeah, this, this rather goes to your question about uh, about Frankfurt and whether any of them had been prosecuted in any way. Yeah. As far as I know, no. Um, wow. Some of them had gone through the denazification process. Some had had, you know, but it's clearly, I mean, one of the, one of the ones who, someone who speaks, and I'm not, I'm not sure if it gets brought up in the film, but uh, Karl Hollander, the uh, the man right at the end who displays all of his, yeah, uh, his artifacts. He, yeah. he went through, uh, he went through the denazification process and clearly it didn't have, didn't have any effect. It didn't have any effect, that's for sure. Well, the interesting thing there is that it, it, our audience now that given what you both said, should realize that if you hadn't heard about the Frankfurt trials yet until you heard it today, one of the things that Sam and John are making us think is there was a limitation to how far the Frankfurt trials could go, right? They simply could not prosecute everyone because according to the indictments for Frankfurt, frankly, everything that was said and not said in this movie would have made them indictable for Frankfurt purposes, mm -hmm. meaning they would have committed crimes according to the prosecution in Frankfurt, but there were so many Germans that would have been in this category that at some point they just stopped. And that is the only explanation, right, 
for that. You know, yes, there were some that went into denazification, but that was a decade before, more than a decade before. So uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, did you get a sense from any of them that they, they, they were thankful to Luke and Sam for giving them an opportunity to either uh, unburden themselves, to speak about it one last time, to ask for forgiveness. There were several of the women that said, you know, we were responsible because we were there, right? Some of the women said something like that. You know, one woman said, the stigma will always be there on Germany, but because we were there, you know, and didn't do enough, it's there for us as well. Um, did you get a sense that some of them were actually were, uh, you know, rose to the occasion and were happy to be in front of this camera? It's a, it's an interesting question, one that was, you know, I know Luke was very, very, sort of very much at the forefront of his mind. The number one, he absolutely did not want to offer these people free therapy, offer them any sort of uh, to, to, to unburden themselves, to feel better about themselves. This is absolutely not what this was about. Um, and he spoke often about the awkwardness that would emerge at the end of at the end of the interviews. There would be on occasion, uh, he said that some of these interviewees would get up and say, thank you so much. You know, it's so nice to be able to talk about these things, which unbelievable in and of itself. Um, but again, there's there is there had to be a line as much as part of this interview process had always had to be conversational, had to be um, uh, relaxed, calm. Um, but yes, it always had, it has its own dangers to think for Luke. I mean, it was uh, yes, putting him in rather rather difficult positions on occasion. Hey, John, I'm wondering whether you would say that you know that this film is going to be available through the Shoah Foundation at the University of Southern California. For people that forgot, the Shoah Foundation was created from the proceeds of uh, Steven Spielberg Schindler's List. Uh, people don't often know that that's how the Shoah Foundation's original financing. I don't know if it's still true. I think one of the reasons it's at the University of Southern California is because at some point the proceeds of Schindler's List sort of ended and now they needed a new new source of funding but i'm asking for this separate question do you think that this is a film that holocaust survivors or their children would um i would not say appreciate but might benefit from or should watch for some reason would you say to them you know what i wouldn't watch this or say you know what i i with great humility with great humility i don't know how you'll respond but I would like to hear your reaction to my film. Do you, has, has that even come up yet? It hasn't come up for us yet over here. Um, again, it's a very good question. It's a tough one to answer in many respects. I think, first of all, Sam can, can, can confirm. I think the entire archive is resting with the Shoah Foundation now, not just the film, or is it just the film? It's just, a, just the film for now. We're, we're having in, in conversation at the moment with Stephen to, uh, to arrange delivery and make sure everyone's uh, with, also with okay, right. our other archival partners. Wait, when you when you're saying Stephen, are you sp saying Spielberg? Uh, sorry, Stephen Smith, the uh, the <laughs> director at USC Shaw. Yeah, okay. I mean, I I I, I, I I suppose I would, you know, I think, I think I, I think it is a film that, that that they should watch. I think there's, you know, there's, you know, you, it, it's always extraordinary to hear the accounts that, of these sorts of accounts and the accounts of this moment in history, this passage of history, and I think. I think there is, you know, there's, there's, it, it is an extraordinary opportunity to see these people say what they've got to say. And I think that there's, that even for the people that you were just referencing, I think I would advise them to, to watch the film because, because of, because just the remarkable content of what, what all these characters have to say, both, both those who are deeply regretful and, and the others, because I think within that, there are great lessons for us not just about the history, but also about the present and the future. So the, there's an interesting scene and it's an unusual scene because most of the film, you know, you're seeing elderly people sitting, eating, talking, chatting, uh, but they're sitting because they're elderly and they're sitting. You, a couple of times you see them walk a little, that's why I said before, they, it gives you a sense of how old they are, you know, and decrepit. Um, but there's one scene that's like a field trip <laughs> where one of the, perpetrators goes to Vansi to speak to students, German students. Uh, for people who don't know what the Vansi conference was, this was when uh, the top line uh, Nazi officials met at, in the town of Vansi at a mansion uh, and basically spent a day or so 
discussing what would then become the final solution to the Jewish question. Uh, basically, what do we do with the Jews, right? The word final solution to the Jewish question, what does that mean, right? That they had to decide what does it mean? And they actually, you know, all very different categories of Nazis are talking very crudely, but bureaucratically about a death factory, about killings, mass killings, either with bullets or with gas and crematoria. And so Wansi has that name, that's what it's associated with. So here we have one of them in Wansi, in at a conference table, talking to a bunch of students. The students' faces are blurred out for privacy reasons. There's an argument that he gets in with one of the students. I didn't fully understand it. I don't know if you want to explain it to me, but I didn't really get the full argument. I just was fascinated by what his response was, the elderly man's response. He gets emotional. And if I'm not mistaken, he says, the camera is on me, not on you, right? The camera is on me. And I'm saying that what we did was terrible. I'm telling everyone what we did was terrible. And, and I think he says, and I could end up being prosecuted. He doesn't say prosecuted, but I think he suggests that by what I'm saying here today, I could get in trouble. Now, did I misunderstand that? Because it was a very quick scene. And he seems, again, when he's alone, he doesn't seem to be quite that uh, revealing or regretful. But when he's at Vansi, he seems to be a different Nazi. <laughs> he seems mm -hmm. to be trying to educate the younger kids. And he seems to be speaking, because there's this really incredible response by one of the boys who says, oh, give me a break. I think he says, he says, you have more of a chance of being killed by a, what does he say? By a- Albanian. Albanian, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a mildly racist comment that no one really understands. His point is, the Syrian refugees that wound up in Germany, you have more chance of being killed by one of those Syrian refugees that Chancellor Merkel brought into this country than you do of being prosecuted for what you reveal on camera today. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating scene. I don't know if either of you want to speak about it, but it is, it's just, it's, and it's so unusual because again, it's, it's a field trip. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the, the circumstances around that interview are in themselves absolutely fascinating. I mean, they were, um, he, it was a, they were a group of students working at a technical college and they were expressing, uh, at, least this, at least this one individual was expressing some very neo-Nazi uh, opinions and very neo-Nazi views. And his teacher um, organized this trip to Vanse House where I believe they hold these, these talks where they can meet and Hans Werk, the, uh, the SS man was associated with them. He has, I think, um, I think I mean, from my, my personal reading of him, he is quite uh, contrite and quite uh, apologetic. He yes, exactly. Lot, he's done a lot of reflecting over the, over the period of- um, Yes, what um, I was saying before, before, in a way that he wasn't the first time we saw him, mm -hmm, right? Sure. He, that's my point. He's much more revealing in this setting. Is it because he's talking to kids, far right wing kids that he's worried about and he's trying to set them straight? Absolutely. He is, I think it's the concern, it's the same way he ends. He wants them, he doesn't want them to go down the same path that he did, believing the same lies, the same nonsense, the same, he's had to go, the, the journey he had to go to undo the damage, undo that sort of the ideological sort of uh, commitment, the ideological training that he went through. I mean, he was a Holocaust denier himself, even after post-war. Um, it was only through a, a, sort of a chance encounter and through education, through reading and through learning that he actually started to question himself, what, what, what was my role? You know, I was, you know, I was a criminal, I was a perpetrator, started to see himself in a different way. And yes, absolutely, that scene is, is trying to challenge that. And his frustration at not being able to communicate, not be able to speak to, uh, to this man, not to try to get through to him. And yeah, ending no, up, it, don't let yourself be blinded, is what mm -hmm. he says. He says, what, don't let yourself be blinded. Yeah. So we have every reason to believe that he understood that he was speaking to people who were simply, were essentially in his position at that age, people that were um, romanticized mm -hmm. this sort of right wing Aryan, you know, white supremacy, right? All the things that Hitler believed in, that, that they, they, they saw it as a romantic period and he was trying to set them straight. There's a really interesting, I forgot the person who's in it who says this line. I wonder maybe John, you could speak to it. He says, uh, the heroes you expect to find, there aren't many of them. Right. It's actually a great line. I think that's the line. The heroes you expect to find, 
there aren't many of them. It's, I think it's said in the context of, yeah, there were perpetrators and the rest of us were complicit, uh, but you know what? It really would have taken a lot to stand up to the Nazis. There's an early, again, I don't think the film is trying to be apologetic, but there's an early scene in which someone says, let me tell you something, all the people who were dissidents before Hitler came to power in the first election, they ended up getting killed. They just disappeared, they just got shot. And I thought it's an, and it was interesting, like I'd never seen a film so boldly set up the idea that, do you understand what would have meant for me to be a member of say the White Rose, right people, those are the students that handed out leaflets and then they ended up, there's just a bunch of students that were trying to call attention to the Nazi atrocities and they all got killed. And so there was this line where it says, look, you know, they're the heroes you would expect to find, like in a Hollywood movie, good luck finding them. Yeah, no, I, and that's the very point he's making is that is exactly that. The threat and the peril was such that there were very few heroes who stepped up. And, and, and in some respects, he's referring to everyone in this film is that, you know, you won't find any heroes in amongst us because we were swept along. Gentlemen, it's a great movie. Uh, it's a tough word to use great when you're talking about such morbid material. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're spending an hour and a half with very, very guilty elderly people, uh, some of whom are not properly acknowledging of their guilt. Some of them are still sort of trying to shift away the blame on someone else. Even if they accept that there were crimes, uh, they simply say, it wasn't me. And then, of course, there's one person who says, I still value Hitler, and I still think he had great ideas, and I still honor him. I just wish he would have done something else with the Jews because it was a distraction, or I think it said it would have saved us a lot of grief. But he's saying, I'm, I don't apologize for anything. So the film is fascinating, it, revealing, uh, gripping, uh, infuriating, all, all at the same time. So congratulations. I know that it's sad that your director is not here with us, but it is a wonderful film. I recommend our audience uh, make an effort to find it. Focus Features is distributing it. Uh, it's an important film and we, we like working with Focus Features. They're a wonderful uh, filmmaking company. Uh, so the film is called Final Account. Um, before we say goodnight, I think we have one quick announcement. We have an event tomorrow night there it is conversations on essential cinema continues it's one of our more popular series we started it about eight or nine months ago uh, we've had sharon stone and matthew modine and and margarita laviva and uh, william fitchner we show classic art house films art house films uh, and we have sort of a special guest to speak about it. This is the actor Mark Feuerstein, who you've seen in a number of movies and television shows. By the way, he was in a really good Holocaust film uh, uh, called Defiance about the Bielski brothers. I don't know if anyone saw uh, Defiance, but Mark plays one of them, partisans in the forest fighting the Nazis. That's a real, and you know what? Uh, I hope I can remember to tell Mark <laughs> that I told the audience for final account that he appeared in a film uh, it was an Ed Zwick film, Defiance, a really great film. Um, uh, uh, look out for all future projects by Sam Pope. John Batsik is an award-winning uh, filmmaker, and he's got a number of other interesting films coming out. He's got one called Abbey Road, uh, so we know what that one's about. Uh, obviously, something to do with the studio and the Beatles. So uh, until next time, uh, remember, we're, of course, a nonprofit. Uh, we're, we'd be happy to accept donations. Uh, we haven't charged during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, until next time, my name is Thane Rosenbaum. See you tonight. See you next tomorrow night for conversations on essential cinema, The Godfather 2. Good night, everyone. Good night, Sam. Thanks so much, John. Thank Good night. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.